Well, hello and welcome to Faith, Philosophy and Life with me, Mr. Shelton. It's great to see you again. I hope you're doing well. Uh, we're in a unit on life and death. And as you know, we've looked at the soul. We've looked at euthanasia, palliative care. And today we are going to be thinking about what happens in the afterlife. This is stuff that I'm sure you have done before. Um, however, I think it's a good thing to look at again. Anyway, now behind me is a famous picture uh, and there's two terms that I want you to think about, which is salvation and atonement. And I want you to think what a salvation and atonement means and where they fit into this picture. So I'm just going to leave that there for a moment and then we're going to grab your pen and your paper and we're going to cue the cheesy intro music. And here's the cheesy intro music. Brilliant. Okay, so uh, what you've got here is you've got the idea of heaven, hell and purgatory and uh, very medieval, obviously. Now, the, the key thing about salvation, salvation means to be saved. As you know, when you looked at uh, one of the units last academic year, atonement means to be at one with God, being made right with God. And Christians believe that atonement happens because of Jesus' death on the cross. And if you look very carefully on that picture, you can see Jesus on the cross and people passing through that on the bridge going up. And that's the idea that Jesus saves you and then you're atoned for your sins and therefore you go up to heaven. Um, so this is our title for today. The title is What Do Christians Believe About Life After Death? And our learning objective is to explore Christian beliefs about life after death. So you just need to get those written down. As usual, do pause this as we go. It's going to be a good outcome if you can retell three key bits of information about what Christians believe. It's going to be great if you can give two pieces of information about each of these three beliefs. And even better if you can put that information successfully into an examination question. Uh, we've got five things. We've got a media clip and then there's uh, an exam question that we're going to look at as well. Um, you will need to access the description below because there are a number of files in that which will be useful for you during today's lesson. So to start off with then, there's a five reasons or reason for an afterlife um, PDF within that Google Drive. I'd like you to access that and you'll find about 13 different reasons in there, maybe 10, can't quite remember. I'd like you to choose five of them, write them down in your book and say what you think about those five. So look at that document, choose five of the uh, beliefs about the afterlife and write down what you think about them. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Why? What's your viewpoint? Why do you hold it? So pause me now and then come back to me when that's done. Excellent. Now, also in that directory is a sheet that looked like that. Now, if you haven't got a printer, then you just need to draw it out or do a little flow diagram. It's entirely up to you. Um, but this is going to tie in with our next media clip. So I'm going to show you a clip that I found online. I'd like you to watch that and to complete the grid as you go. Now, it's really straightforward um, and I'm sure it's very intuitive. You'll be able to work it out as, as we play through it. So here's the clip. There's the worksheet. Make sure you've got the stuff. Enjoy. This revision video is looking at Christian beliefs about heaven, hell and purgatory. Now let's start with looking at the ideas of hell from a Christian point of view. In the past, they concentrate on hell literally being a real place. So a place of eternal and indescribable torture for non-believers and people that have turned away from, from the church, from the religion. In the medieval times, it was the church that actually kind of used hell as a way to scare and, and keep people in fear and almost control people to keep them belonging to the religion and obviously supporting the religion. Today, some Christians do believe that hell is a physical place because in the Bible there are some evidence to say actually it's, it's there, it's real. 
You know, it's a place that you will spend eternity being tortured. Uh, Matthew's Gospel is a good example here. God said to those on his left, the goats, this is taken from the parable of the sheep and the goats, depart from me, for you are cursed into the eternal fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. So making it sound like a very real place. Uh, a lot of the Christian art came showing these terrible, torturous places. I mean, look at the photo here. Various different methods of torture shown. However, some Christians look at hell as not being a real place, so more of a symbolic idea, a way to kind of sum up being without God, so just nothingness. And obviously being without God is the worst thing imaginable, and I suppose that's where some of the ideas of hell come from, because when you try and think of the worst thing imaginable, what comes to mind? But basically it is being without God, so not real, just nothing. Let's look at the Christian ideas of heaven, and of course heaven would be the opposite to hell, and therefore that is eternal presence with God. So you're in God's presence. Now again, let's go to the Holy Bible and let's have a look at where these ideas come from. Well, there's quite a few uh, references to heaven in the Bible. And Revelations gives a lot of descriptions of what heaven is like. Uh, one of them here from 21.4 says there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Well, that sounds like a lovely place, doesn't it? Revelations again, 21.18, talks about the actual descriptions. It says the walls, the foundations, and the walls are made of jasper and the city of pure gold. That's pure as glass, so quite a spectacular place. Foundations decorated with every kind of precious stone. So, you know, a place of wonder. Obviously, one of the key things here is, you know, Christians believe that life after death is eternity, because obviously your soul is eternal. That hopefully goes back to God and heaven, and it is eternity you spend with God. So they look at it from that point of view. Now Christians also have an idea of purgatory, but let me just stress that this is purely a Roman Catholic belief. So when you talk about purgatory, you've got to say Catholic belief, because obviously they're the only denomination in Christianity who have this uh, idea. Purgatory, Catholic Christians believe that when you die in a spiritual state and you're in a friendship with God, so you've been good, you'll go to heaven. However, a lot of people when they die are not quite ready to be in God's presence so they're not quite pure enough yet and therefore they have to go through what they call final purification or where they go to purgatory so that they can be purified. Now think of it like this, obviously purgatory it is kind of a state of you know being suspended in the middle you're kind of waiting, you know, people often refer to it as God's waiting room so they're not obviously bad enough to go to hell, they're not good enough yet to go to heaven but Eventually, you know, they will be purified and they will go to heaven. This belief in purgatory also explains why Catholics pray for the dead. So they basically believe that they're not beyond help. They believe prayers could help those people in purgatory to hopefully be released and join God in heaven. Which is why Roman Catholics believe in saying prayers for the dead. Okay, so a few other notes just to make in your book. So you do need to make a few notes from things that I say on the screen behind me. So um, there's the idea that there's three stages um, within the Catholic teaching, and it is only within the Catholic teaching. Protestants, Church of England, Baptists, all that element of the church only have heaven and hell. They don't have a purgatory. Um, whereas the Roman Catholics uh, do have this idea of a purgatory, which is why uh, they pray for the souls of the dead. So what we've got here is you've got this idea that souls with mortal sins, that is so, people that have done terrible things that haven't known Jesus, um, they will go to hell. You've got this idea of purgatory, souls that, that know Jesus but maybe haven't quite got there perfectly yet, um, they would go to purgatory, where they would stay until their soul, uh, till their sins are, uh, are dealt with, and they'd go to heaven. Um, and then you've got souls that have been purified before death, maybe through uh, anointing of the sick or, or, or the final rites of passage, maybe through other things that they've done, where well, they would go to heaven. So people that believe in Jesus will generally end up in heaven. It just takes them maybe a little bit longer if they've gone to purgatory first. Uh, people with sins that haven't been dealt with, maybe people that don't believe in Jesus, would go to hell. Now, there's a big divide uh, within church teaching that, that, that some would say one thing, some would say another. Roman Catholics are actually divided on the issue as well. Um, whereas uh, the, the traditional teaching of the church is that those that, that believe in Jesus whose sins haven't been uh, purified would go to purgatory before going to heaven. Purgatory then means to purge, to get rid of your sins. 
Catholics accept that people uh, cannot be perfect despite trying their best. And people make mistakes in their relationships with others and then they uh, have the opportunity in purgatory to make up for those errors uh, and the same is true with their relationship with God as well. Eternal life then is where you have a state of perfection with God. Cleansing or purging the sins enables you to be in the presence of God and purgatory helps people to understand this now just for a second just imagine uh, a perfectly white room with white floor and white ceiling the other way around and uh, white white walls and uh, and you want to go into that room well that that room is kind of like god it's pure it's perfect the moment you step into that room you are uh, not going to make it perfect anymore because you'll have dirt you'll have grime on you you're an imperfect person um, so what uh, the Bible teaches is that um, you kind of need to get washed, you need to get cleansed. And some elements of the church would say Jesus' death on the cross is enough with that. But within the Roman Catholic tradition, they'd also say that you've got to do something as well as just trust Jesus. And that would be uh, you going to heaven. So that's uh, you going to purgatory, sorry. So that's the idea of purgatory. That, that there's an onus on you to do something to make up for that relationship, uh, but it, Jesus as well also uh, deals with that. I know that might be a little bit confusing, but that's part of the issue with this topic. So key things to know, heaven is where you go when you're right with God. Hell is where you go if you're not right with God. Purgatory is where you go if you know God, but you haven't got it all right straight away. And then you'll go to heaven. So the imagery of purgatory, uh, art and literature uh, shows the idea of fire, uh, the Greek word for fire being pure. And it comes from an ancient custom of burning the land to cleanse it. Uh, St. Paul uses this idea in 1 Corinthians 3. This is a really key one to make in notes in your book. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test each person's work. And if what is built being survives, then the builder will receive their reward. So that idea of being cleanse that idea of being pure that's a really important quote to have in your book so make sure you've got that because i am moving on okay um now uh, other key things though is that it might be useful for artists to have this imagery uh, as this idea there's a halfway house between heaven and hell uh, but the main idea of purgatory is that hope is behind it okay don't forget the whole idea of christianity is that it is full of hope that there's a hope of the afterlife that, and we don't just mean hope as in something that's wishy-washy that we might understand, but we mean hope as in something which is a strong, secure faith. That's the definite Christian definition of hope, is a certainty. Hope that, that, that cleanses the final cleanse of sin will occur, and there you'll have eternal life with God. And that's why Catholics pray for those who are died, because they, their prayer is that that, that purgatory element will, will not be for very long, that there will, will be hope in eternal life. So what we've done today is we've thought about um, the three key beliefs of what Christians believe. We've thought about two bits of information for each of those as well. Uh, so what we now need to do is tie it into an exam question. So this is our God jitters here. Um, these are different quotes you can use. So you can say the Bible teaches that. Choose one of those. Um, it's a C question again. So you're looking for point, point, evidence, explanation and change. Two paragraphs of that. Point, point, explanation, evidence and change. PP Gak. Um, and our question is this, explain what Christians believe about life after death. Explain what Christians believe about life after death. It's an eight mark question, so you've got eight minutes to answer it. You need some uh, evidence in there, some biblical quotes, some church teachings in there as well. So pause me now, give yourself eight minutes and let's get two paragraphs written. And you need to send this to your teacher at the end as well, please. Okay, so let's just see how we would mark that. Um, first of all, please can you identify any religious terms that are in there? Bible, heaven, hell, purgatory, Jesus, any of those church teachings, anything. Okay, now if you've not found any, then you're not going to be scoring above a one or a two. Simple as that. Um, to score a five or above, you must be using sources of authority which have been explained. When you've done that and you've identified sort of the bracket of where you're heading, um, you've got to work out, is it limited? Is it a really short couple of lines? That would be a one or two. Is there one paragraph? That would be a three or four. Is there a paragraph with quotes that are explained or sources that are explained? That would be a five or six. Or is it excellent? Is it one of those that you'd like you'd sell on some sort of, I don't know, exam selling website? But you should do that because that wouldn't be a good thing to do. 
and probably wouldn't be legal either. So that would be eight marks uh, if it's absolutely amazing. What we would like you to do is to send that through to your teachers so we can look at that and grade that and send that back to you. So that was the question. What do Christians believe about life after death? We've talked about what would make a good answer. Maybe to give yourself an EBI, an even better riff. Give yourself a grade. And we'll just move on to conclude. So our learning objectives we've covered already and we've evaluated our exam answer, which is excellent. So this is our final task. I'd like you to write down three questions with answers that you could ask somebody else about today's work. The more challenging, the better. So it could be, where do Catholics believe they go after they die? Not a particularly challenging question. But you might ask, what do Protestants not believe that Catholics do? Oh, Church of England believe, not believe that Catholics do. That would be a lot of more of a tricky question. And then why not send those to one of your friends on WhatsApp or Messenger or TikTok or whatever you're using today. And on that note, I will leave you. Thanks very much for your time. Take care. God bless. Stay safe. Wash hands and the rest of it. I'll see you soon.